since uh, we want to have plenty of time for Q&A at the end, um, and we're getting tight on seats, but there are some seats up here, there's some seats over on the side, um, and there's some extra chairs. We may need to bring a chair, a row of chairs here in the middle. Um, my name is uh, Dan Paraka. I'm the coordinator for the annual country study program at KSU. Um, so every year, KSU picks a country, and then we offer programming all year long. We offer special courses. We're actually taking students <coughs> to Cuba this semester over spring break. Um, and, um, and so this is the year of Cuba, if you haven't figured that out already. Um, so, uh, we, we have a lot of t-shirts. I think we've run out today. But at every event, we always bring t-shirts to give away for the year of Cuba. <coughs> And help promote the program and let everyone know about it. Um, we've got a lot of great upcoming events. So let me just show you. This is our website, um, which is dga.kennesaw.edu. Actually, I think you can just go to yearofcuba.com. So yearofcuba.com, and you can see all the programming and events. So next, um, next. Um, next Wednesday, we have a reception for a, uh, an exhibit that's being done by our students. Kennesaw students um, took the, the uh, Orisha, the Yoruba Orisha deities of Cuba, and they've made them into like superhero caricatures. Uh, it's a pretty interesting project. And then also on the 25th, we have a, actually a pair of talks um, by Robert Lawson from Southern Methodist University. Um, so there's this says 11, but there's actually another talk. I think I can just look at this. It's at 9.30. So 9.30, he's doing one on economic freedom and the wealth of nations. And then the 11 o'clock is more focused specifically on Cuba. Um, and there's so many great events. I'm not going to go through them all, but I want to highlight our conference. We have a conference on Friday and Saturday of March 20th <coughs> and 21st, um, which students can attend the, the conference sessions for free. So we're going to have pre presentations like all day long from like 9 in the morning till 5 p.m. with different experts on Cuba. It'll be a great way to learn more, different panels. And at the end, on Saturday night, we have a concert. Um, uh, Brenda Navarrete is this world-renowned jazz, Cuban jazz musician. Um, she plays a drum and she sings. Um, that's going to be a really stellar event, so you don't want to miss that. And then the very last event of the semester is a theater um, program, a, a play, um, two nights for a, a, and the troupe is coming from Miami. It's a Cuban-American theater troupe out of Miami that is doing an incredible play. So those are all my announcements. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll, you didn't just close it down, did you? I hope not. I don't think so. OK. Oh. Just been, uh, um, so let me introduce our speaker. Uh, many of you know him because you're taking his class. Um, Dr. Tom Lindsley is a um, professor of political science. Uh, here at KSU in the School of Government and International Affairs, and he teaches courses on Latin American politics and international relations. Uh, his latest book is The Peace Corps in Latin America in the Last Mile of U.S. Foreign Policy. Um, so Dr. Nisley was a Peace Corps volunteer himself in the Dominican Republic. Um, I was also a Peace Corps volunteer, it turns out, um, in Sierra Leone. Um, I highly recommend the Peace Corps. I'm happy to give you more information about Peace Corps. We have a Peace Corps prep program in here, here at KSU. We also have a Peace Corps fellows program for returning Peace Corps volunteers who want to go into graduate school here at KSU. Um, and, uh, and his current research uh, is focusing particularly on um, China and in Latin America. So uh, thank you, Dr. Nissen. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. So we're going to talk about Cuban foreign policy uh, today. Now, if you read the flyer, you'll, you'll notice that I, I pointed out that 
to speak of a Cuban foreign policy in itself is, an, is a puzzle. It's an odd thing. Uh, Cuba is a very small country, but when you look at its foreign policy, it's quite active and has been and continues to be. And the puzzle is here is, is why? What are the, what's the source of the Cuban foreign policy? And what I'm going to argue in this presentation is that it's nationalism, Cuban nationalism. Uh, before we talk about nationalism, let's get a little political science here, for political scientists here. And let's talk about the levels of analysis. And the levels of analysis point to different areas in which we have sources of foreign policy. And there are three levels of analysis. You've got the system level or global level, the state level, the domestic level, internal, and the individual or personal level, looking at individual leaders. Now, when we talk about foreign policy and where the sources come from, most sources of foreign policy are coming from the global level. We talk about states and having a foreign policy. Um, if they have a neighbor, they share a border. Most conflict in the world historically has been over borders. So if you share a border with another country, you ne necessarily have to have some sort of foreign policy. Now, if you're a major country that has a large economy and has broad interests, you often have a very extensive foreign policy. Think of some of the major trading countries like uh, Great Britain uh, in the 19th century, the United States in the 20th century, and China today. Um, and that usually drives a country's foreign policy. Now, if you don't have neighbors, and if you're not having this broad, expansive economic interest, usually countries don't have much of a foreign policy. And Cuba, well, does it have any neighbors? Well, it's, it's an island. It's not even like Haiti and the Dominican Republic, which share an island. And it's a small country of, of 11 million people, but it has had a very extensive foreign policy. So what I'm going to argue, it's not the global level. We're going to have to identify some factors at the state or individual level. And what I've identified is nationalism. Now, Latin America in general is a very nationalistic region of the world. As I like to say, you put a Chilean, an Ecuadorian, and a Colombian in a room together, and very soon they'll be fighting with one another as to who speaks the better Spanish, who has the better food, who understands the game of football better. Uh, very nationalistic. Now, most Latin American countries gained their independence early on in 1824. And Simón Bolívar, who had an a vision of a broader country, learned quickly of this nationalistic tendencies as the different uh, countries split apart. Now, Cuba didn't get its independence at the same time that other countries did. And the Spanish often referred to Cuba as the ever faithful isle. But there were many Cubans who didn't want to remember the, remain the ever faithful isle and wanted their independence. And finally, in 1868, the first war for independence breaks out. And it goes on for 10 years. And it's a long, dragged out war. And this war for independence against the Spanish is, is a, a multiracial, cross-class conflict. Cubans from all different walks of life were struggling for independence. But after 10 years of fighting and over 200,000 people dead, it ended up a stalemate. Although not all gave up. Antonio Maceo, who we'll talk about in a minute, uh, started out as a private at the beginning of the 10 years war, ended up a general, and never, never capitulated to the Spanish. Uh, but there was a break until 1895. And this we mark as the, the second war for independence. And it's Jose Marti, who had been imprisoned in the earlier independence war, who leads uh, this uprising. And Antonio Maceo also comes, comes into play. But in the interim between the first uh, war of independence and the second war of independence, the United States becomes very interested in, in Cuba, has a lot of business interest. And Jose Marti, who had spent some time in New York, was a bit concerned about the United States. And Marti did not survive very long in the Second War. Uh, Antonio Maceo also was, was killed. Um, but in the United States, there was this drumbeat about Cuba Libre, needing to, to free Cuba. And many in the, the struggle were remembering what Jose Marti once warned about the United States. And that was that once the United States is in Cuba, who will get her out? Nevertheless, 
the United States did intervene in the war. And interestingly enough, you know, the, the Cuban rebels were almost at the point of victory when the United States intervened. And the intervention uh, was rather a humiliation because many of the troops that came in were, were white Southerners. And many of the Cuban rebels were Afro-Cubanos. And the white Southerners didn't respect the Afro-Cubanos. And instead of allowing them to take the cities and march in victorious, they, they pushed them to the back. So that ended up with a condition of Cuba as a US protectorate. And the United States inserted in the new Cuban constitution the Platt Amendment, which basically gave the legal right of the United States to intervene anytime it wanted. And Cuba was not free. Now, the United States took Puerto Rico and still has Puerto Rico. It couldn't necessarily turn Cuba into a, a colony because part of the mantra was we're Cuba Libre, we're freeing Cuba. But Cuba certainly was not a, a sovereign independent country. It's what um, we can refer to as, well, as a protected polity. Joseph Tolchin came up with this concept of a of a penetrated polity, excuse me. And a country that's a penetrated polity is, is one that often a small, weak, weaker country that finds itself in, in the orbit of a larger country. And a pe penetrated polity really doesn't have much of a foreign policy. Its foreign policy is directed toward uh, the dominant state. So in this case, it's the United States. So all foreign policy is based on making the dominant state happy. And the domestic leadership within the country, they gain their, their support by maintaining strong links to the dominant state. And Cuba is not the only, at this time, penetrated polity in the region. The entire Caribbean basin, essentially these countries are semi-sovereign countries. And oftentimes if they, they act against the United States, the United States would invade. But also, they're quick to follow along. And you can think about this. When the United States um, declared war in World War I, many of the small Caribbean countries also declared war. Some of them were under occupation by the Marines and have much of a chance or choice. But they followed right along. The same thing with World War II, where we see some of the larger countries in South America were hesitant to join in. Dominican Republic and many of the Central American countries all followed along. And even more recently, it's a, a uh, a fact that's kind of been forgotten. When the United States invaded Iraq in 2003, this was very unpopular with much of the world. Um, but George W. Bush decided to assemble a coalition of the willing. And of course, the British were there. But three smaller countries also sent troops. The Dominican Republic, Nicaragua, and Honduras sent two to 300 troops, which again suggests that their foreign policy is moving right along to, to satisfy the United States. Now, we have a third war for independence. And this is sometimes not the way many people think about it, but the Cuban Revolution is essentially a third war for independence. The dictator Batista was one of those domestic leaders that followed right along with what the United States wanted to do. And the revolution liberated that. And it's telling. that after the revolution, a very important individual in, in Cuba made this statement. The revolution will truly come to power. It will not be like 1898 when the North American came and made themselves masters of our country. And that individual? Fidel Castro, yes. And we have to think about the Cuban revolution. Now, often people talk about socialism and communism. But I would argue it's more about nationalism and trying to maintain independence from the United States and not being a penetrated polity, not being a protectorate. So what does the new Cuban government do? Well, first it has to suffer a, an organized invasion by Cuban exiles, the Bay of Pigs. Now, you think about that. Well, why did the United States want to overthrow Castro? Was Castro uh, violating human rights? Were people being killed and thrown in prison? Yes, clearly so. But had that bothered the US administrations prior to that? No, 
And we've got to remember the Bay of Pigs was organized under Eisenhower. Eisenhower, during his administration, sent his vice president, Richard Nixon, to give a medal to, to Batista. Somoza was considered a friend, and the dictator Trujillo in the Dominican Republic. So being a human rights violator was not the issue. The issue was that Cuba was beginning to push back against the United States, trying to exert its independence. And one of those ways it did was to make connections with the Soviet Union. Now, we're wrapped up into the whole Cold War thing, East, West, the communist, and Cuba begins to adopt some of the same type of policies. But think about it from in terms of, of dealing with a, a dominant power in your neighborhood. It's a good idea to find connections with another major power, but one that's not too close by that it's going to come and dominate you. So you can play one off the other. So the Soviet connections were not, I would argue, not necessarily driven by this, this ideological bent, but more as a way to keep the Cuba independent from the United States. And of course, we ended up with a, the major crisis of the Cuban Missile Crisis, the closest we came to World War III, um, and it was a near miss. But that crisis put the United States in a position where it said, okay, we're going to let this thing happen in Cuba for now. But that didn't stop Cuba from expanding its foreign policy. And when you get it, it's incredibly fascinating to think about such a little country acting as though it were a superpower, doing things across the planet. That is not what little countries do. One thing the Cuban government did was support revolutions in Latin America. So Che Guevara, Fidel Castro, and others were seeking to make connections with other organized movements throughout the region to create, essentially, problems for the United States. It'll be difficult for the United States to, to crush Cuba if it has to deal with all these other little issues going around. So very active in that, that activity. But not just in Latin America. Also in Africa, Cuba became very involved in uh, national liberation movements through Africa. And early on, uh, in Algeria, now, Algeria fought a, a war against the, the French. Algeria was once a, a directorate part of France. But from 54 to 62, uh, Algerian uh, nationalists fought to, for liberation. And for Fidel Castro and other Cubans, this was you know, something that, that they felt deeply. You know, here was another national liberation movement. And the war in Algeria was not wrapped up in the whole Cold War, the East-West conflict. Now, of course, the French were, were yelling loudly that the Soviets were involved, but there is no evidence that the Soviets really cared about Algeria. It was truly a, a national movement against, against French uh, colonialism. And at the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis, the, the, the um, Cubans were also actively supporting Algerians. 61 to 62, they sent in uh, fighters to help train. And some of the, uh, the uh, letters and um, uh, journals that these Cuban advisors had, uh, they spoke about how it was very similar to their time up in the, the Sierra Maestra, and how these Algerians, you know, had different types of weapons and, and were, you know, you know, just trying to get by with what they had. So very romantic in that connection between the two. Also, Cuban doctors were sent to, to help out with wounded uh, uh, rebels. And when the French finally left, one of the things that happened is a lot of the French citizens, about 800,000, decided to up and leave. Many of these were doctors. So the Cubans sent in their own medical personnel. And to show you the extent that uh, Cuba felt for supporting another independent country that had struggled against imperialism, in 1963, there was a border dispute with Morocco. Now, Morocco was far more well-armed, had Soviet uh, tanks and aircraft and French aircraft than, than Algeria. Uh, the Algerian leader, Ben Bella, asked Castro, asked Cuba, can you help us? And Cuba had just recently received 22, at the time, new T-54 tanks that had infrared night vision fighting capabilities. And part of the agreement the Soviets said is, we'll, share, we'll give you these tanks, but you can't share it with anybody else, not even the Bulgarians. And the Cubans simply ignored it. They put those 22 tanks on a ship and sent them over to Algeria, manned by Cuban soldiers ready to fight and defend Algeria. 
Now, it didn't come to a, a shooting conflict, but that shows you the extent that Cuba is willing to exert itself for other independent countries to maintain the independence. Now, in return, Algeria helped uh, funnel weapons to uh, uh, guerrilla insurgents in, in Argentina and Venezuela. So there was the mutual collective helping out. And the Soviets really are not part of this whole project. And there are other countries, particularly the, the uh, at the time were Portuguese colonies of Angola, Mozambique, um, uh, Guinea-Bissau, Cape Verde, mm -hmm. where Cuban was actively organizing to try to uh, exert independence for these countries. Oh, yeah. And the quote here from Nelson Mandela, and we'll talk more about the, the Cuban activities in uh, Angola. But one of the first countries that Nelson Mandela went to visit after he was released from prison was Cuba. And here's the quote. We come here with a sense of great debt that is owed to the people of Cuba. What other country can point to a record of greater selfishness than Cuba has displayed in its relations with Africa? So many of the African countries that, that gained their independence owe a lot to Cuba. And again, this is that part of that connection. Supporting other independence movements reinforces our notion of independence. And though Cuba was allied with the Soviet Union, at times it was the Cubans that were taking the lead over the Soviets. For example, in 1965, the United States began its Operation Rolling Thunder in uh, Vietnam, in which they began to bomb North Vietnam. And this was alarming for Cuba. And you can imagine, so if the United States are bombing North Vietnam, what's going to stop them from bombing Cuba? So the Cubans urged the Soviets to arm the North Vietnamese with, with more effective anti-aircraft weapons. This is when the SA-2, the first surface-to-air missiles, began to move into to North Vietnam, which had great effect. But it's the Cubans that are pushing the Soviets. And sometimes we think of the Soviets as just using them as their pawns. Uh, the, the Cubans had their own, own agenda. Now, they did do some side work for the Soviets. And remember, they're not able to project this military capability without the Soviet Union providing. Having a, a functioning military air force, tanks, and navy is, is expensive. So the Soviets were providing a lot of funding, providing the weapons. And in return, Cuba did do some, some side work, as I say, for them. So, for example, uh, 1973 to 1975, after the October War in the Middle East, in which uh, Israel fought Egypt and Syria. Now, the, the war between uh, Egypt and, and Israel ended up in a stalemate, and that's another, another whole story almost ended up in World War III. Uh, but the Israelis quickly took out the Syrians. Uh, the Syrians tried to take the Golan Heights with their tanks. The tanks were simply destroyed. So Syria did not have any tanks or people to operate the tanks. So Cuba offered to help out, and the Soviets were very happy with it. So you had from 73 to 75 about 1,000 Cuban troops who were manning uh, three tank battalions, and they would periodically get into little skirmishes with the Israeli forces. And that was at the, the bequest of the Soviets. Also in 1978, in Ethiopia, uh, 16,000 troops were, were sent uh, to repel the Somali army that had invaded, and this was at the bequest of the Soviet Union. That's 1978. But again, I want to emphasize that Cuba is working with the Soviet Union, but it also sees itself as leading a broader independence struggle throughout the world, which is connected back to its own independence from the United States. So as I say here, it's not just a Caribbean Bulgaria. And why do I say not a Caribbean Bulgaria? Well, for the Soviet Union, if they needed anything done, they'd go to Bulgaria. You want a pope assassinated, you find a Bulgarian. So the Bulgarians were very quickly there to, to do whatever the Soviets want, wanted. But Cuba was not that. They were not simply being led around by the nose by the Soviets. Now, that's a perception we had in the United States, particularly in the heat of the Cold War, that, that it's all directed by the Soviets. In fact, Cuba used to upset the Soviets. They were not happy about 
Cuban activities in Latin America, particularly promoting armed struggle. And the Cuban government started almost immediately in making connections with other revolutionary movements in the region, providing weapons for them, providing training back in Cuba. Um, the Soviets were a little bit nervous about this. They were afraid that, that this type of activity would provoke a major response from the United States. And they thought that would be detrimental to their long-term policy. Now, don't get me wrong, the, the Soviets were actively engaged, uh, engaged in what we call active measure campaigns, kind of the same thing they've been doing in, since 2016 here, where they're putting out stories, propaganda that's counter to the United States, trying to undermine support for the United States. And there was a one story I came across when I was in the, the Peace Corps in the Dominican Republic, and it turned out it was a story the Soviets put out. And I don't know if anybody else has been to Latin America, but I came across this story that, and people were convinced of this, that American tourists were coming to Latin America uh, to adopt babies for their body parts. Yeah, and it was a story, and I found out yeah, other, other parts of Latin America that this story is circuit. Turns out that was a story that had been planted by the Soviet Union. Also, they planted the story that the United States um, created AIDS intentionally to spread it around. So they were not trying to support the United States. They were actively trying to undercut. And they were doing things such as you know, recruiting agents for their activities, supporting uh, political candidates who were sympathetic to them, like Salvador Allende. So the Soviets had an agenda, but they didn't like the, the more aggressive activities that the, the Cubans were, were taking. And this is kind of a, a back and forth with them. And it was said that you know, a lot of these uh, Soviet KGB officers would come over to Cuba, and then they would go native. You know, they'd get to Cuba, they'd get wrapped up in the whole, the whole idea of revolution and, and, and didn't rein in uh, the, the, the Cuban activities. But finally, in, in 67, they sent somebody who said, that's it, you've got to stop this. Now, this was to the demise of Che Guevara. Che Guevara had uh, taken off to the, the, the mountains of Bolivia. He had hoped to start a new revolution there that would spread out through the entire region. And the Soviets came to the Cuban government, Fidel Castro, and said, uh-uh, we've got to stop it. And Che Guevara wandered around the mountains. He couldn't get support from the villagers. The Bolivian Communist Party, under orders from the Soviet Union, said, no, we're not going to help you. And eventually, a ranger battalion that had been trained by the United States tracked him down and killed him. Uh, so that put limits on, on what the Cubans could do. But that didn't stop them from acting without consulting the Soviets. And here we get back to one of those colonies of uh, Portugal. 1974, the dictatorship in, in Portugal comes to an end, the democratization in Portugal. And along with that, the, the decision is made by the Portuguese government that our colonies in Africa, Mozambique, Angola, Cape Verde, Guinea-Bissau, are now going to be independent. Now, there had already been active movements within all these countries are buying for independence. Now, in Angola, the popular movement for the liberation of Angola, the MPLA, was the, the, the group that had basically won. There were other smaller groups that were not aligned with the MPLA. And the MPLA was a more leftist nationalist group. Um, and as the clock was ticking for independence, the MPLA was going to take over. Now, I don't know if you know geography, Angola, south of Angola is Namibia, or at the time known as Southwest Africa, and South Africa. Now, Southwest Africa, Namibia, was occupied by South Africa. And there was an independence movement there, uh, SWAPO. And the South African government was afraid if the MPLA took control in Angola, then they would then support the, the movement in, for free, uh, liberation of uh, Southwest Africa, and that would cause them problems. Now, this is history. Um, South Africa at the time, this is the time of apartheid. So you had a white minority government that was in charge and denied civil and political rights to the majority population. Uh, the white South African government did not want to see the MPLA come to power. So they invaded. They invaded Angola. Now, in the news stories at the time, it wasn't clear. The Western media you know, wasn't identifying this. This was uh, these were South African troops coming. Maybe they were just mercenaries, white mercenaries. Uh, but the Cubans understood this. And the MPLA understood this. And the MPLA asked 
the Cuban government for help. And Fidel Castro made the order. He said, send troops. He did not consult with the Soviets. He did not ask the permission. He just immediately sent troops. And this column of South African troops, along with some of the Angola and supporters they had, we were heading to, to, to take the capital. Uh, like about 67 Cuban special forces had rapidly come in and stopped them. And that wasn't it. They continued to send more and more troops in. Now, later on, the, the Soviets realized what was going on and said, OK, we'll help you out. So initially, it was Cuban ships, Cuban aircraft barely making it over that were sending the troops. But then the Soviets said, OK, we'll send them on. And these Cuban troops came in and engaged the South African military forces, who were supposedly better trained, had better weapons. And the Cuban military forces defeated them. Not only did they stop them, they pushed them back. And they fled back to, to uh, what is Namibia. And the reason I gave the, Nelson, the quote from Nelson Mandela, and also from the flyer, this picture up there, Nelson Mandela said, you know, this action by the Cuban government was the first step that led to the end of apartheid. Because here, the idea of this of white supremacy, these, these white uh, uh, South African forces, you know, were, were, could not be defeated. And here you had black and brown Cuban and Angolan troops who just defeated them completely. And that kind of undercut that whole mantra about, about white supremacy. And that wasn't the end of it. Finally, 1979, the military uh, armed rebellion that the, the Cubans had been pushing finally had success in Nicaragua, the Sandinistas. And the Sandinistas had been fighting since the 1960s to overthrow uh, Somoza. 79, it finally came to success. And the major factor in the success was Cuban intelligence. The Cuban intelligence had, had broken uh, Somoza's codes. So they were telling the Sandinistas in real time, the troops are moving here, they're moving there. And that led to the success of the Sandinistas. And with another base of operation, uh, Nicaragua, along with Cuban support, and more support from the Soviet Union at this time, as the Cold War had heated up again in the 80s, uh, for uh, armed insurgencies throughout Central America, in El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras became essentially a military base of the United States in which the United States uh, conducted operations to support the Contras who were fighting in Nicaragua. You know, a lot of violence, a lot of conflict. In fact, a lot of the issues that Central America still faces today stem directly from those activities there. But the Soviet Union collapsed. Now, even before the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, with the ascent of uh, Mikhail Gorbachev and his perestroika and Glasnost projects. The Cold War was winding down. The Soviets were less supportive of what they were doing in Central America. The Cubans weren't happy. They didn't like this idea of perestroika and Glasnost. They didn't like the idea of the, of the Soviets becoming closer with um, of the United States. In fact, every opportunity that there was a, a time for detente, the Cubans uh, rejected it. In fact, going back to Angola here, um, Right before that, the Ford administration had proposed a, uh, a, an opening of, uh, of uh, relations between Cuba and the United States. So they were putting out, out this idea that you know, we can normalize relations. And the Cubans were faced with this decision. Do we go help Angola, or do we make normal relations with the United States? And I think the choice was easy for them. Normal relations with the United States means we could lose our, our independence. But the Soviet collapse ended the largesse that the Soviet Union provided. And Cuba entered what was known as the special period, a time of very serious economic decline. And their once vaunted military no longer had the resources. Um, and at the time, people were thinking that you know, Cuba's going to collapse and they'll be opening up, everything will change. But they remain strong. Now, it's also a period in which you have uh, those who are no longer committed to the project of Cuba are often uh, uh, leaving, particularly going to the United States. But as we get into the 21st century, 1999, 
Hugo Chavez comes to power in Venezuela, and Hugo Chavez was an admirer of Fidel Castro and the Cuban project. You know, they really uh, worked together in terms of helping uh, save Cuba. So new friends. But something else also developed, something I'm calling here the Cuban Peace Corps. And this becomes much, much more important for Cuban foreign policy, particularly when Cuba no longer has the military as a foreign policy tool. And they had been doing this since the beginning of the revolution. And that's the use of doctors and health professionals. I mentioned in uh, Algeria, when the French medical personnel pulled out, the Cubans were quick to send in Cuban doctors. And since 1960, over 325,000 Cuban health professionals have served in 158 different countries. And when you think about that, that's, that's a huge number. Uh, the Peace Corps has been around since 1961, and I think we're probably up to just barely 300,000 American citizens have served. And Cuba's, what, got 11 million people, and we had at the time 250 to 300 million people. So a larger percentage of the Cuban population has been out there working. And as I already indicated here, doctors have now replaced soldiers as the lead in foreign policy. And the doctors are still out there. And these doctors who are serving out in these different countries, this benefits Cuba in a couple different ways. These doctors create good feelings toward the Cuban people, to the Cuban uh, government. It creates what Joe and I called soft power, so the power of attraction. It also brings in $8 billion a year. Now, I've got a list up here you can take a look at if you want to. Cuban medical personnel and doctors are all over the world, throughout Latin America, Africa, different countries. And some of these countries have quite a bit mon of money, like Qatar. So Cuban doctors in Qatar, which have a very high-tech medical facility there, uh, they get paid a lot of money. Now, the doctors don't get all that money. They get a couple thousand dollars at the most, and the rest of the money goes back to, to Cuba. Now, countries that are kind of mid-range, like uh, Brazil or South Africa, they pay like $4,000 a month for the Cuban doctors. Again, the Cuban doctor gets about 1000 or so of that. The rest goes back to the Cuban government. But in some of the very poorer countries, the Cubans do not charge anything. So they finance some of their the activities in the very poor countries based on the profits they're making from the, the other countries. And interestingly, the program in Haiti, which there's over uh, 181 health professionals in Haiti, no, excuse me, 567 health professionals in Haiti, it's Norway. Norway is paying for that. So this has benefited Cuba. And also interestingly, Brazil was a huge program. There were almost uh, 10,000 health professionals in Brazil. Now, I don't know if you've been following Brazilian politics, a guy named uh, Jair Bolsonaro was elected, kind of the tropical Trump and he's very anti-Cuban. Uh, the Cuban doctors left. Now, the Brazilian government thought, well, no problem, we'll just put Brazilian doctors there. But just like the Peace Corps, the American Peace Corps, these Cuban doctors were serving in the very poorest regions. And many of the Brazilian doctors that went to replace them, they didn't last, they simply left. So unfortunately for Brazil, the, the, the medical help that they had from, from Cuba uh, is no longer there. Also, in pushing a, an active foreign policy, in 2005, Cuba created the Henry Reeve Brigade. Now, Henry Reeve was an American who fought in the first uh, war for independence, and he died there. And this brigade was established to help countries with natural disasters, so again, bringing their med medical capabilities to bear. And it was interesting in 2005, because they decided to create this official uh, organization to respond to a disaster that happened in 2005. A hurricane. A hurricane named Katrina. And Katrina hit New Orleans. Yeah, the Cubans asked, told the United States, we'll send 1,500 doctors to help out in New Orleans. Well, of course, the United States simply ignored that. But again, it kind of shows you the audacity of the Cuban government. We're going to 
create this natural disaster relief organization, and we're going to help out the United States to show you know, we're on equal. Well, the U.S. didn't take them up, but shortly after that, there was an uh, a, um, earthquake in Pakistan, and the Henry Reeve Brigade deployed there. They were also very active in, um, in uh, Western Africa during the Ebola crisis. In fact, they were nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize for their work they did, did there. But again, it kind of shows you this, this whole uh, you know, need for the Cubans to push forward an active foreign policy, not with the military, but now with doctors. All right, last slide. So again, wrap it up. How do we explain this? It's not the system. Cuba's a small country. It's an island. It's not responding to a, a great outside world that, that it has to deal with. If they wanted to, they could just remain basically isolated. Now, another explanation could be the individual level, that it's, it's about Fidel. Now, if you've ever studied Fidel Castro, he was quite an audacious individual. You know, some of the stories of his childhood where he threatened to burn down his parents' house if they didn't put him back in the school that he was thrown out of. Or the time that uh, he was bet like $5 or so to if he would crash his bicycle into a wall, and he did it, put himself in the hospital. Or when you think about the Cuban Missile Crisis, he told um, Khrushchev, if Cuba has to be destroyed for, for the, the, the savior of the revolution, do it. Um, and even think about where he came onto the scene. Uh, in 53, was it 52, there was going to be elections. Batista came back and, and short-circuited the elections. Fidel was going to run for office. That upset him. Uh, so instead, he organized a bunch of other individuals. And they were going to attack the government. But did they go for a, a soft target, as we'd say, for, as a terrorist would? No, they attacked an army barracks. It was a suicide mission. So Castro was very much this audacious individual. And so we could say, you know, maybe that is the case. But it's hard to pin it on just one individual, because there were many other Cubans who were also uh, advocating this. So again, I would say it's Cuban nationalism. And Having an active, self-directed foreign policy means that Cuba is independent. It's a way of exerting and maintaining their independence. We are not going to be a penetrated polity. We are not going to be dominated by the United States. And they continue. And we think about communism. You know, we still have the Communist Party in China. I don't know how communist they are. And, and Cuba still has the Communist Party, but they've got some, some capitalist uh, developments there. And relations with Russia have resumed. With the rise of Vladimir Putin, uh, the Cubans have opened up. Now, Russia is no longer communist. And just to show you how the connections between uh, Putin's Russia and Cuba now, uh, two events that happened. Um, the, the Russian Orthodox Church opened a cathedral in Havana. How uncommunist is that? Communists don't do churches. And the uh, Patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church uh, met with Raul, and both Raul and Fidel, when Fidel was still alive, were given awards by the Russian Orthodox Church. Again, what's the connection with Russia? It's not communism anymore. It's, it's that other major power that we can kind of push back on the United States. And even though the United States normalized relations with, with Cuba in 2014, and President Obama visited in 2016, um, I would argue that Cuba will continue to resist stronger ties with the United States, because that would mean that, the United, that Cuba would become a semi-sovereign state, a penetrated polity. Um, interesting that the open relations, it shows you how Cuban foreign policy works. In 2008, or was it 2009, when President Obama went to the Summit of the Americas, the other Latin American countries said, you've got to bring Cuba back in. Cuba had been excluded from the OAS. And a lot of that sentiment of bringing Cuba back in had to do with all the work that Cuba had done throughout the region. So their foreign policy had paid off. Um, now, before President Trump came to office and through the early part, I don't know if you heard about the, the sonic attacks on American diplomats. Mm -hmm. Now, I've heard some people say that you know these sonic attacks, they're, 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 they're uh, crickets or grillos or they're um, uh, frogs, and, or maybe these, these are diplomats that are just kind of freaking out because of an open new post. Now, I've met quite a few Foreign Service officers, both in the State Department and USAID, and you know, these tend to be some of the coolest, calmest individuals I've ever met. They're not given to flights of fancy. So I have a hard time believing that it's all psychosomatic. Uh, we don't really have the hard evidence, 
but it has kind of raised some warning flags and it would not surprise me if the Russians and some Cubans who still want to keep that separation from the United States were behind this project. And then of course Marco Rubio and Donald Trump have kind of pushed back. But again, I would argue that Cuba will continue to try to push the United States away as a way of maintaining its independence. Okay, so we still got a few minutes. Any questions? Went a little longer. Yes, Will. So like for, for, a, like, for a systemic approach, could you not argue that it was like um, pushing against the colonialism of the era of the middle of the 20th century, the mid 20th century? Well, yeah, you could say the, the coming from colonialism and outside, but even after that, you, is there some other, it, it seems to me that it has to come from, from inside Cuba. Because, I mean, life for Cubans generally could be much better than it is. It's not a great life. In the, you have some American tourists that go there and say, oh, Cubans are so happy. Well, no, it's not that great. Uh, their life could be much better. But in order to do that, they would have to give up a lot of their, their independence. They would have the United States come in. And then, you know, when you're a penetrated polity, the United States can, you know, can do good things for you, or then they can uh, demand that you do things. Like, uh, what was it, Guatemala now has to, to house El Salvadorians coming in. When President Trump said, you do that. Mexico, to a certain extent, is becoming a penetrated polity, where its foreign policy is not independent. The order's been given to, to uh, AMLO, the president of Mexico, no Cuban doctors and no oil for Cuba, because the United States doesn't want to see that. Any? Yeah. Um, how, who else are the sort of non-aligned countries in the world? I mean, in some ways, and you've been studying China and Latin America. China's, I think, tried to position itself often as not aligned, you know, with Russia or the United States. And um, are, yeah. are there other well, 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 connections you would? China's make interesting. Or? I mean, you would think that that maybe uh, China could replace but the Soviet Union was. The Chinese are not doing that. They have basically told the Cubans, we'll, we'll do some trading here, we're not coming in that way. Because they're very cautious, just as the Soviets were again. They have longer term ambitions within the region and the world, and if they were to, you know, Cuba is that, that country the United States government, you know, it really is upset at. You know, how dare you defy us, you little country. Uh, and if China were to start providing largesse and money to Cuba, I think that would, would spark a major, major reaction. So th they will know that. Now, Russia is essentially a, a, a revisionist uh, great power, a declining great power. So for them, it doesn't cost much to, to send in spy ships and fly some bombers in there occasionally. Yeah. You mentioned how they are, how Cuba is investing more in the medical field, and um, I mean, they're medical field has become more dominant than their military might. So are they kind of diminishing the military? Are they still keeping a good state military? Yeah, I mean, they're, 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 their Air Force is, is gone. Air Forces are very expensive to maintain, particularly modern Air Force. So they don't have much of an Air Force. They have an army, and they have, they have tanks and some of that nature. But they don't have the ability of what they once used to have. Planes, just build soft power yes, and, you know, use, use the medical resource. And it's more than just sending doctors out. It's, uh, it's also people come to, to Cuba, there's a medical tourism going on, or for training. So they provide low-cost training for doctors. But again, it's, it's, it's still a way for Cuba to, to have a foreign policy, to be out and active, and keep them engaged. Anybody else? All right, we're almost done. All right, we'll last question, I guess. All right, so you and I have spoken about how, um, like, like the idea that I was talking to you about how most re almost all revolutions are more so um, like the catalyst is a nationalist sentiment, whereas they may use ideology like communism or Islamism as a medium through which they express their nationalist aspirations. Yeah. So in, the, in regards to Cuba, how, how much the communist or socialist ideology permeate through the society opposed to well, a nationalist? E even before the revolution, uh, the Cuban uh, electorate, Cuban ideas were, were fairly left to center. I mean, so it, 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 they moved further to the left. So it wasn't like they went from a very conservative, very libertarian society into something that becomes very socialist. So they were already that way. So it wasn't that alien to, to, politi to Cuban political culture. But you know, they went much further, particularly with the connection with the Soviet Union. But again, I would argue you know, a lot of that had to do with, well, this is the, the way we have to go to push against the United States. The United States is doing this. We're going to do that.
And now, you know, the Cuban economy has changed. They've opened up to tourism. And this is one of the reasons that some of the doctors are upset. And they actually can make more money going overseas because there are so many doctors in Cuba, they don't get paid anything, but the guy running the, the, the tour operation for the Canadian tourists is well paid now. So that's creating divisions within, within society. So. But yeah, I would I'd say the, the driving undercurrent is, is the idea of national, nationalism and being independent sovereign. All right. Anything else? Thank you very much. Thank you.